Hello, everybody. Uh, wherever you're watching this in the world, uh, whether you're watching it live or whether you are watching it on demand, I'm Martin Cross and I have an incredible guest today. Three times Olympian, twice Olympic champion, five times world champion in the women's eight and a, a host of other medals as well beside that. Megan Musnicki. Hi, Megan. Hi, Martin. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. I've been very excited about talking to you. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. For some time. Just a quick word about the sponsors, Ludum, who make these uh, interviews possible. Ludum is the performance monitoring software for sports coaches and sports training groups. And um, it's, a, it's a great tool. It's a great system. You can get a 30-day free trial by visiting ludum.com. So, Megan... How's retirement treating you? Um, it's going. Uh, initially, so let's see. The Olympics ended how many months ago now? We're in. We're almost in. We're basically in February. So yeah, five six months ago, uh, yeah. I managed to uh, get married, move across the country, and um, start a new life, so to speak. Uh, it's it's going. It's hard. Right. You know, retirement is not um, I've been in the sport since well, since college, but at the elite level, I've been training since 2008. Uh, so it, it's um, it's mentally I would be lying if I said that it wasn't a challenge. You know, um, you have some good days and I've had some really not so great days and you just kind of keep keep going. It's a lot like training. You just push put one foot in front of the other and keep going because it's it's an adjustment. What kind of, I know you said you, you, you've you been training already this morning and the mornings seem to be your time for training. What what kind of stuff are you doing? Um, I do, uh, I, I love working out. I always have. That was one of the things that kind of was great about uh, rowing for me was that I actually enjoyed the training aspect of it. Um, so currently I run, I bike, I lift. Um, I do like hit training. Um I've earned a small handful of times. <laughs> I was going to ask you. Uh, actually, funny, you, <clears throat> I just started erging again, I would say like a week ago, because I have a really, a really bad case of plantar fasciitis and from running so much. And so I can't run and I'm so sick of riding the bike that I'm like, oh my God, I have to <laughs> this is terrible. Um, but usually any, you know, I hike, <clears throat> excuse me, I hike a lot. Um, I just love being active, but in the morning, it's kind of my, more of my regimented workout where I'll do, um, some weights and cardio and, or some like high intensity cardio. Yeah. That's, that's an amazing amount of change, you know, to come, to come back from Tokyo, as you described, moving across the country and then marrying your fiance. Is it Skip? It is Skip. Yeah. Skip, uh, who's out here, um, coaching at CRC with Mike. So uh, we're all, I'm still very much in the rowing world. I'm just now on kind of the men's side of it more. I see the men's side of it more. Oh, that, that, that's really interesting. So um, ha, what are you, what are you looking, are you looking to, to work full time or are you giving yourself some time? What's, what's the plan? Yeah, I am. I'm currently working part time for actually a, uh, a company that's based in Australia. It's called uh, Syro. It's a Australian research company. Um, so I do part-time work, obviously remotely, um, for them um, as a research associate. And I'm currently working with uh, ACT. Uh, you've probably heard of it, Athlete Career Transition. Yeah, yeah. Andy, Andy Moore and his brother. Um, so they're, I'm working with them to try and find uh, a job, a career, um, and kind of figure out what exactly that is. Like, what what is what it, what is it that I like, that I want to do, um, that interests me? Uh, it's it's a journey, right? Like it's an exploration yeah. uh, to, to figure that out, to kind of define who I am outside of the sport. And um, how many of the women that you were rowing with in uh, Tokyo have, have decided that that was their last games and are, and are in a similar position to you? Um, let me see here. Of, of the eight, the four and the, um, of the eight and the four, I would say at least half, or about half are done. I mean, they were a very young group. Um, we, you know, I I brought the median age up um, in the eight, but, but other than that, it was a, it was a it was a pretty young group. So, um, well, a lot of them are coming back 
Um, but then there's also a handful that are not that that was like Olivia Coffey. Um, I believe that was her last one. Uh, Christine O'Brien, who's in the eight. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag, I would say. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things I'd like to talk about is, is the U S system and, and, uh, and what it's like in the, the post Tokyo era. But I'd, I'd kind of like to take you back first of all, to look at that incredible career progression that you had from starting in 2008. I believe um, you didn't start rowing until you were a freshman at college. Yeah, I started rowing my freshman year at a uh, division three school. So just a small, like I just walked on because I've always, I've always played sports and team sports. And uh, so I just walked on, uh, I happened to walk onto the team because the, uh, the rowing coach saw me as I was going to go talk to the basketball coach and was kind of like, Hey, come try this. And I was like, absolutely not. I have, I had no idea what it was. I was like, no, I'm here to play basketball. I want to play basketball. But uh, I changed my mind, apparently, and it was a good decision. So how does a woman from a Division Three college <laughs> get into, the, you know, close to the national team? What's, what's uh, that progression and, path look like? And it, and it was an incredible amount of stubbornness. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> I, so I graduated college and uh, went to my first kind of development camp. I had just heard about the national team that there was rowing beyond college my senior year actually at NCAAs and I went and I rowed at kind of um, just a, a, a generic development program uh, under Kevin Sauer who is an amazing coach out of UVA as you know yeah. um, and uh, was down there and enjoyed it but didn't really didn't really think much of it beyond that and then I happened to be at Crash B's one year um Let's see, I graduated in 05. So the, I happened to be at Crash B's in like 2006. And yeah. Lorel was there. Oh, right. And uh, the only reason I went to Crash B's was because I was bound and determined to get my 2K under 710 because I, I graduated college with a 711. Yeah, yeah. I want to do this. I really want, for no reason. Like I just, that's what I got in my head. And so I went to Crash B's and I went like 7097 or something. And wow. I, I thought I was the greatest. I was like, this is amazing. And Laurel came up to me and she's like, you know, you should, you should come to this. Uh, uh, I, I should come to this forest camp this summer um, for, for worlds in Princeton. And I'm like, yeah, obviously she wants me to come. I just went 709 on my 2k, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, so I show up to this camp and uh, I mean, I may have made it two days before I was cut and sent home. I mean, it was, you know, Susan Francia was there. Karen Davies was there. Oh, she wow. Caroline Lynn was there. Like, I have no idea who these women are. I just know that yeah. they're probably two to four inches taller than me and crush me on the erg and are significantly better technically than me as well. Um, but that was when I kind of got, like, I got the bug. I was like, oh, I want to come back here. This is really like this. Well, I mean, it was, it was the best of the best all right there in yeah. at this one place. Um, and, uh, it, I was like, what do I need to do to get back here? Essentially, you know, and obviously I needed to do everything, but I had to pick one thing to start with. And for me, that was kind of just work on um, my fitness and um, get in a boat, get in a smaller boat more. Um, and so I moved to Boston um, and started rowing on a Riverside boat club uh, in their high performance program under Tom Keister and uh, was there for about a year and a half before um another crash bees another conversation with laurel another invitation to uh a camp uh that again happened to be down i had to think about it so long ago that it again happened yeah. to be down in virginia with kevin sauer it was in it was in 2008 so it was the camp for the four that because it wasn't an olympic event that year yeah yeah and um so it was a bunch of athletes from princeton who didn't make or who were cut from the eights camp initially, plus some other development athletes. And I actually made that boat. And so all we had to do was go to trials and win. And we were going to go yeah. to the championships. Uh, well, one, one of my boatmates caught a crab in the last 250 meters and we ended up losing. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so oh. Uh, yet again, uh, I failed to make the team, but you know, that was the first time Tom came up to me and was like, okay, you know, you've obviously made a lot of progress in the last couple of years. You're, you know, you're putting in the work and improving. Uh, would you like to come to Princeton in the fall? So in September, after, after he gets back from Beijing uh, and live and train full time here, obviously, yes, that, you know, that was, that was the goal at the time. So, um, 
I packed up my stuff and moved to Princeton, New Jersey, and actually lived with um, Megan Kelmo and Ellen Tomek. Oh, wow. Um, that must have been a... a, a... <laughs> so I lived uh, with them when they got back from Beijing. And um, 2009, I spent all of 2008, or the fall of 2008 and the spring of 2009 before uh, I think worlds were in Poland um, in, I mean, I'm not even exaggerating when I say like the bottom three, anything we did, I was terrible. I mean, really? Oh, awful, awful. Um, you know, whether it was on the erg or on the water, I just, I was no good. Um, and uh, again, got cut for like, so this is the third time here. If you're, if you're keeping track, uh, <laughs> And Tom sat me down this time and he's like, you know, I, I can't keep cutting you. And so this is, I think this is right before the squad went to Lucerne, maybe yeah. um, in 2009. He's like, you know, I, 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 this is the third time. Like, I, I just can't keep cutting you. Um, you know, you have, you have a, he gave me a time standard for my 6K, which I actually forget what the exact standard was, but I remember that it was like, 20 to 30 seconds faster than anything I had ever done before. Oh, he's wow. Like, Come and he gave me this date in September. You know, he's like, you can go home for the summer or go wherever for the summer. Um, and then on this date in September, you can come back and you'll 6K test. And in order for you to stay, you have to hit this standard. Um, and I won't lie. Like initially I was, I, I did the whole like, oh, what was me? He's so mean. This isn't fair. <sighs> he doesn't like me, blah, blah, blah. But then I was like, no, like I, I just wasn't good enough. You know, I wasn't fast enough. He, he wasn't wrong. Like, it doesn't mean that it wasn't hard to hear. Yeah. But it's one of those things that you kind of have to just internalize and be like, well, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to blame him and everybody else and be like, oh, well, there was this one time where I did finish not in the bottom three. What about that? Why doesn't that one time count or something? Um, but so I kind of picked myself up and after I was angry for a little while and was like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to go all in. And at least be able to say at the end, if I didn't make it, that it was on me, that like I gave 110% and did everything that I felt that I could do. Um, <clears throat> so that summer, uh, I spent most of it training on my own. Um, you know, I went, my family went on vacation and uh, I remember I would run to this, we went to Cape Cod and I, every yeah. morning I would get up and run to this gym that was like two miles away uh, where the average age of the people there was probably like 65 to 70 <laughs> and I'd sit in this corner on this janky erg and you know was miserable but I was bound and determined to hit this standard like I was like I'm doing this um you know and so you, you just kind of make these choices and I went back in September and sat down and uh I crushed the standard he gave me oh, and you're I just, yeah I just remember feeling such a sense of satisfaction because it was what I, like it was, it was a direct, it was a direct, it was the end of what something that I had done. Like I had complete control over that, right? Like I took control of what I said that I wanted and put in what it took to get there. And the end product showed that, which is an incredible feeling. Um, and so uh, I was allowed to stay in train for 2000, uh, for the 2010 worlds team. And that's when I made my um, first worlds that summer in New Zealand, I guess it's technically fall. It was October. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand worlds, 2010. Uh, and then um, was in the eight, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19 and 21. Um, so, and so, where I am. so, so Megan, um, just to unwrap, um, it it sounds like that you know an amazing story of resilience you know very much against the odds and um i think people watching would be really interesting to to learn specifically how you made such an enormous jump in your 6k erg score um, um, because it wasn't that you weren't trying before in in the training setup at princeton so you know what changes did you make or what changed that allowed you to make that well, progress? I think there's a lot that goes into it, right? I mean, I erged all the time. To get faster on the erg, you have to erg. There is no way around it. It is, it sucks. You, you know, it's boring. It's hard. It's, you don't want to do it, but I erged all of the time. I needed to hit an erg score. 
So I was going to erg. Um, I did a ton of that. It wasn't anything profound. I, I just chipped away at it slowly and kind of delayed instant, like that, in, that immediate instant gratification of certain things for the bigger picture. Um, you know, I wish I could say it was like, oh, well, this one workout was the one that was the secret to my success. No, it was hundreds of workouts over and over and over again on top of each other. And w- when I didn't want to do it, I still did it. When I wanted to stop, I didn't stop. Like you just, it's a level of kind of grit and toughness that um, it required of me. Like, cause I wasn't, I wasn't fast initially. And some people are, and that's amazing, but I wasn't, I was slow. So where, where, where does that grit and determination come from? Is that, is that in your genes? Had you built that up over the experiences you'd had, you know, in 2008 and 2009? You know, I think I'm, I think I, there's a lot of it that's in my genes. Both my parents were um, very active and, you know, the um, kind of our, our work ethic was, um, always very important. Like our effort was always very important, um, in terms of kind of how, how I was raised. Um, if I didn't get like straight A's, that wasn't as big of a deal as if I just didn't try, you know, mm-hmm. if I was giving a hundred percent and came away with a different grade other than an A, then that's, you know, that's fine. Cause you're giving a hundred percent. But if, if I wasn't, and that was kind of the outcome of it, then there would be an issue. So yeah, it was, it was partly in how I was raised. Uh, I joke, I, I come from hardy stock. Um, yeah. You know, like I was very lucky in my career to not have to battle a lot of injury, which kind of derails you and kind of takes away the, uh, the endurance aspect of piling workouts on top of each other, you know, just kind of consistently over time. Um, and then you, you develop it as an, as an, an elite athlete. And I would say, being at the training center in Princeton helped foster that, you know, like I was with at the time, great athletes. So what I would do, yeah. is, you know, just because I, I hit that time standard in 2009, doesn't mean that every team I made after that was a cakewalk. Like I had to, I had to prove myself every year, but what I did was become kind of like a student of the sport. Like I would look at the, the people who I was training with who were very successful, who came before me. And I would be like, what is that woman doing? You know, yeah. doing extra work. Is she resting here? Is she, you know, eating something here? Like what, what is, what does she, what does it look like that she's doing and try and learn from that because it's the perfect environment to do it. Who stood out for you? Is there any, was there any, I know quite a few of the women must have uh, have been phenomenal, but you know, who particularly stood out for you in terms of modeling? Um, I would say the two, well, and it's hard to say because I ended up being in boats with them uh, a little bit later on in my career. But I would say um, in terms of her work ethic, Erin Kafaro for sure. Oh, wow. Um, hands down. Like Kafaro and I are similar in size. She's about an inch shorter than I am. But both of us were, are not tall. Maybe she's closer to two inches shorter than me. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, she she's an animal, you know, and like when you're smaller, especially in that era when the women on the U S team were six, two, six, three, six, three, six, two, and then car and six, four, when you're five, 10 or 11, you you gotta, you gotta give your, give the coach reasons to want to put you in that boat. I mean, you always have to, but like even more, right. Like over someone else. And um, so I I watched her, Caroline Lind. I watched a ton. Um, Yeah. Susan Francia, I rode with her obviously a lot in the pair. So I learned uh, she's who she's who was uh, uh, blessed with the uh, with the opportunity to teach me to row a pair. Um, was that your first international race with her? Oh, yeah, that was my first international international race ever, Lucerne, uh, twenty ten. That's a hell of a regatta to start with. Isn't yeah, it? I was like, this is amazing. I was Martin. I was so nervous. I thought I was going to throw up at the start line. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is terrifying. But it, I loved it. You know, that, I loved it. It was you came so second cool. in that regatta, I think. Yeah, I came in second. It That's was, a pretty cool result. Yeah, it was, it was great. You know, it was, uh, it, I've had some amazing experiences and some amazing races and have learned so much from kind of just the, the wide variety of women that I've tra- had the opportunity to train with. So um, in, it, it's not that you 
just made the eight in 2010. You you made it in the sixth seat, I think. I was in seven in 2010. Oh, are you we were, seven? We were uh, starboard rigged, so I was seven. Uh, okay, so Mark, the only reason I was up there was because I probably f couldn't follow for crap, and that's where I like. <laughs> <laughs> be real, it wasn't because I was that skilled. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, you know, in the stern of a world championship gold medal boat. I mean. Uh, do you remember what it felt like when you were told you made the team or was that something that you kind of suspected would happen because of your results? No, I mean, you, you know, as you go along where you are, right? Like in different rankings and, you know, your numbers are posted and assessments and like how you do in different races, um, like or inter-squad races and stuff. You kind of know where you are, but it's never one of those things until the day that Tom tells you or announces oh. who the, the athletes that he's going to submit to the performance committee to be on the team are at least I never, um, I never take a breath until then in terms of like being um, sure that I've made it, which I know sounds ridiculous and people are like, Oh, that can't be true. But it's just not my, it's not who I am. You know, um, I knew I was in a good position and, and very likely was going to make it, but you never know, like you could get injured. You could all of a sudden start to do really, really poorly. You could not mesh mm. with the crew well, like, there's any number of things that could happen until, until, until I heard him say it. Um, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It, you know, it's, it's an, in, it's an indescribable feeling and it, the same, I'll always remember when I made my first Olympic team and when he told us, um, it's just, there are memories that you will always have that will never uh, kind of leave you. Yeah. So despite, been uh world champion in 2010 and 2011 the whole pressure ramped up for that olympics of 2012 i guess by by what you were saying there so um i i i've heard from talking to other people that the selection pressure for the women's eight usa women's eight in 2012 was enormous could you talk a bit about that and what it felt like sure um so yeah it's not it's not a secret to make any U.S. women's boat um, is is very challenging. Um, one could make the argument that the competition that we do or the um, what we do when we're at home um, is a, almost but not quite as hard as when we compete internationally. Um, and I think yeah. that's a testament to the success that we had. Um, you know, the, the bar is high. The standard is high. You know, in, in 2012, you say like making the eight was very hard. Yeah. But at the same time, Martin, I watched that women's quad go through their selection. And I just, oh, yeah. I distinctly remember thinking to myself, oh my God, I don't know if I'd be able to make it through that. But that, that is what made that quad, what part of what made that quad so great, mm -hmm. you know, that they went through that together as a, I mean, it was brutal. It was brutal. I felt, I really felt for them, um, you know, cause the eight was um, the eight had been decided a couple, a couple of days before the quad was finished with their, their seat racing and their selection. And so I remember we were out for um, kind of like a swing row after uh, we had heard that barring anything major happening, this was going to be the, the Olympic eight. And I remember the quad launching to do like, I don't know, whatever number piece it was, yeah. in 102 degree Princeton heat, you know, for like the third or fourth day in a row and just watching them and being like, those women are animals. Yeah. Like I just have so much respect for that. You know, it was, it was, it was amazing to watch, but that's what makes the group so great. That's part of what made the group so great is, yeah. you know, it didn't matter what boat you were making that year. You had to work to get in it. Yeah. What are the hallmarks of a Tom Taha training program? I mean, how's it how's it balanced, and uh, and how does he how does he take into account when you guys get really tired? And um, is there any individualized? You know, you, you can sit this one out, Megan, or um, it depends. I think I think it depends on where you are as an athlete. Uh, Tom doesn't ever make you do anything. Uh, I will say that. Um, most of the pressure you put on yourself or most of the pressure comes from the pressure you put on yourself. Obviously I can okay. only speak for myself. Um, I can't speak for any of the other women, but, um, my drive to perform, my drive to show up every day, my drive to not take, 
um, time off was pressure that I put on myself, not that Tom put on me. Um, and, you know, his, his training program was challenging. Um, but I want you to name another coach that has had that much success that has a weak training program. Yeah. That, that that's going to just be like, Oh, you don't feel so great today or you're a little tired today. It's okay. You can take it off. Like it's, <laughs> if I said to Tom that I need to sit out today's row, 100%, he'd be like, okay. But I would never say that. Well, okay. That's not true. I wouldn't never say that, but it's going yeah. to, it's going to take a lot for me to say that because that's just the standard that I have for myself. Um, you know, like it's hard. If it were easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. If training at the elite level were easy, everyone would do it because it's incredible when you win. So tell us if you can remember, I mean, uh, some of the sessions, the, the tough sessions that you would get asked to do, what were those, um, what were those sessions? I think I'm trying to think. I mean, there's, there's so many, right? Like um, a lot of them, it's not that the workouts themselves are so profound or um, hard on their own. It's just the, cum the, the accumulation of them, right? So the, the stacking on top, the building of your training program, you know, the building of the volume or the building of the intensity or whatever it is that you're currently fo focusing on for that training block. Um, he did a really great job of structuring it in such a way that it was challenging. Like I remember in, <laughs> I remember in, um, oh, it must have been like 2015, maybe, um, being in Chula Vista, which is where we go for winter training, where we used to go for winter training, and just being, you're just profoundly tired all the time. You're just, you're, you're tired because you're training hard, but there's something so satisfying about it. Uh -huh. Looking back on it, obviously at the time, I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? But, and it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't because there was like one day where he did this ridiculous workout that was like insane or something. It was just the added, the, the constant building of added stress yeah. in, in terms of training load. Um, and he, he titrates it, right? Like he, he's got his finger on the pulse of what's going on with the team. You know, on the team, there are you, I think as a, as a coach, um, you look at, you look at how the athletes carry themselves, how, you know, how loud is it before practice starts? How loud is it after practice? Like just the energy in the room, right? You, yeah. you, read, you read that and you can kind of gauge like where your athletes are at without even asking them. Um, and I think both him and Laurel do a pretty good job of that. And then there are times when it's like, okay, yeah, their energy is low. They're tired, but we kind of need to continue on. And then there are times where it's like, okay, yeah, they're, it's time to pull back. You know what, what that point is. I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a coach. I'm not Tom or Laurel, but I think they did a pretty good job of it. Yeah. Um, Brandon, who's watching. Hi, Brandon. Thank you for your question. Um, he's, he wants to know how the trading program evolved over your elite rowing career. And I, I, I think one thing to go with that is, you know, uh, with Jürgen Grobler, the, the British, former British chief coach. I mean, he used to come back each Olympiad and the training each Olympiad would get harder and harder uh, mm -hmm. and step on. Uh, um, so what did you notice over your career? I would say that is accurate or similar. Um, so my first quad, 2008 to 2012, um, we did a certain amount of volume. I don't like, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, obviously, but then I remember coming back in 2012 after the Olympics and going back into the group, because there's still a group of women in Princeton, the ones that didn't make the Olympics that year are back training. You know, they're back before the Olympians come back. And when you come back as an Olympian, you're slotting back into a training program that's already rolling. Yeah. And so I remember coming back and being like, oh my God, we're already here. Or in terms of like the volume that we're doing. So I, I, I think it's a, sim a similar concept in that you, you build on it every cycle. Um, Having said that, I think there is um, a lot of nuance to it in that it's only as much as the athletes can handle um, and without like injuring themselves. 
uh, and still being able to produce, um, you know, results on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that you're looking for. And so uh, Tom, I mean, he would obviously have the answer better to this. I believe structures it so that it was, it, it built, you know, like it's, it, it's yeah. nothing, it's nothing profound. It's not, it's not like he has some secret sauce. He just, all of our training builds on itself and then you pull back a little and then you build on it and then you pull back. And like what we focus on, whether it's power or quickness or endurance or, you know, changes throughout the year and throughout the cycle, but it's, um, it's, it's not like there, again, I, I think a lot of people think that there's one answer to that question. Like, what is it that made, like, why were the women so good for so long? Like, what did Tom do? What was your training? And I don't think, I don't think you can point to one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the balance of your training in terms of, you know, weight training or land training stuff on the, erg? Uh, we did a lot of, on the water. you know, everybody knows that the U S women erg a lot. Um, Tom utilized it uh, a ton for fitness. Um, it's, it's, uh, in, it's a great way to get nonstop, uh, endurance training without having to stop and spin. You know, we don't, uh, in Princeton, we don't have the luxury of having, you know, six, seven, eight K stretches of water or anything like that, that you can just go. Um, so I think it, it was utilized a lot in that sense to, um, tack on, uh, additional, uh, minutes, so to speak of, of training. Um, our strength change, our strength cha training changed throughout the year, again, depending on where we were, like we, our strength was different around race time versus in the middle of winter training versus in the fall. Uh, Laurel did uh, a good job, uh, with that for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting. Well, yeah. Ahead. What, um, I was going to ask you actually, I, I meant to ask you while you were talking about your ago, what, what did your 2k PB end up becoming? Uh, 630.6. Whoa. I don't know. I managed to take some time off of that 7-Eleven. Thank God. <laughs> when did and when did you pull that? Do you remember? No, 20, <laughs> uh, 20. I'd have to I'd have to text Laurel and ask her. She she would know. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was the the Rio Quad. It might have been 2015. I'm pretty sure it was sometime in that in that four years. Yeah, yeah that four-year segment uh it definitely wasn't before 2012 i know that so yeah no it had to have been it had to have been in the real one i don't remember the specific year though yeah yeah so you're first time olympian going in as a double world champion the, the pressures on the u.s who are the favorites to take gold um how did you find that experience and, and what was the race what are your memories of that race in the final um the experience was incredible um the London Olympics was an amazing experience, um, you know, both in how it was run and where it was located and just everything about it. And, you know, obviously I'm biased because it was my first Olympic games and I came home with an Olympic gold medal, but there's just something about the London games that was, it was just very special. Um, let's see the specific race. Um, I remember before we launched for the final, um, talking with the women, uh, we were just kind of sitting there and it was, it was this, um, calm sense of calm intensity, I guess, you know, like we knew, we knew what we were capable of doing and what we wanted to do. And it was just a matter of executing and capitalizing on the opportunity to do it. Uh, I have, no recollection of the warm up. <laughs> um, I distinctly remember sitting at the start line and I was in five seat behind L Logan and uh, sitting there before they had even started to pull the crews and, you know, just kind of looking around and breathing and feeling nauseous, which is only the second time in my career that's happened. You'll remember the first time was when I lined up with Susan in 2010 in the yeah. And then now uh, at the at the start line of the final of London, and I remember her, you know, Elle and I are very close friends. And she turned around and she like patted me on the leg, and she's like, "Moosey, this is what this is what we train to do. This is the fun because <sighs> all the all the women call me Moose." 
And uh, I just kind of looked at her and she's like, we're ready. And I looked at her and it was enough to kind of like get me out of my head just for that split second. Yeah. Like, yeah, we are ready for this. Like, let's do this. You know, and it, it was amazing. It was an incredible feeling to have her turn around and do that. And then I just remember, um, I think you would know the answer to this. Was the British, or was the four in the race right before us? Oh, I think it might have been actually. Because we were sitting at the start line. It was some big race that the that you guys had a boat in. And you could hear the crowd at the start line. It was deafening. And I remember wow. thinking, wow, this is incredible. And so uh, I was like, this is so loud. And um, we start, and of course, Mary is our coxswain. And uh, we had told her after the uh, heat that one of the issues that we had had was in the last uh, 500, three to 500 meters. We had we had trouble hearing her because the crowd was so loud. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll turn my cox box up. Great, you know, good feedback to have. And so she's turned it up all the way at this point. And we're at the start line. Martin, we get to 750 to go. You can't hear her. Like, <laughs> it's so loud. It is so loud. But at this point, you're just like, you're on autopilot, right? Like, you know, you know, your race plan, you know what you're doing. Karin is up there. Like Caroline is up there. Al is up there. Like, like, you're just, you know what you're supposed to be doing. And you've done it so many times before that it's kind of just ingrained in your head. And so you can kind of like, you can kind of hear her voice, but not really make out what she's saying. And it's just like, get me to that finish line. Like, get my bow across the finish line first. And it, it was amazing. It was, it was an incredible feeling. And I just remember thinking in like the last 250 meters, don't let Canada come back on the outside. Don't let Canada yeah. come back. On the yeah. Outside. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then we, we crossed the line and it was just like an experience that can probably never, ever be replicated. A feeling that can never be replicated. Yeah. Um, how did it, how did that compare to the Rio Olympics then in um, terms of the Rio experience? Olympics, the Rio Olympics was great too. It was different. It was different in Rio um, because we were so far away. And I know like technically we were far away when we were um, in London, right? Cause they had us in the, the satellite village, but at the same time, it was almost like a, it was almost like a world championships in London in terms of like, the housing aspect of it, right? Because it was yeah. all of the rowers in this one place, and then afterwards you got to you went to the main village, and so yeah. you, you still got to experience the big being a, a part of like the Olympics, the big, the whole scene. Um, in Rio, it was it was different because we were obviously in the the village, but it was so far away from everything else. Uh, you know, they did they did the people were wonderful. They also did a great job. Um, the view like the scenery of Rio was incredible in terms of racing under you know where yeah. we were racing and uh it 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 too was an amazing experience like I, ha I have no I have no complaints about any of the three the three Olympics that I raced at in terms of like how the cities how the cities hosted it and what they did yeah so um again you've managed to win three world titles I think that 2013 was you won by a street, 2014 that FOSS course in Amsterdam and 2015 in Egbelet. So you're going on an undefeated run. I mean, what, what does it feel like to be going to an Olympics having got that background of results behind you? Yeah, I mean, it's you, it, it, there's a lot kind of, I guess, there's several things that go into it when I think about it. Um, one is, yes, there was that streak of winning that the U.S. women have done. But at the same time, we always thought the women in the boat were different every single year, right? Like, it's not like the boat was the exact same nine women every single yeah. year. It was those nine women that were trying to replicate it. It's a different group of nine women that sometimes hadn't raced together before, you know, as that group of nine. And it was all about kind of seeing what we could do on that day um, and, and what we could capitalize on. And if we could take the opportunity to capitalize on it and put something out there that would put us in a position to win, um, mm -hmm. then that would be incredible. Um, 
you you try not to think about like oh well we have you know the team hasn't lost in x number of years or whatever because what's that going to do for you nothing yeah you just it's it's not something you need to think about it's really not that it's not like think about today think about what you and this group of nine women need to do or want to do today yeah so um what are your memories of that 2016 final um Let's see. I remember being down. Uh, I don't know what, like 750 meters in, were we down? 750. Yeah. Meters? Yeah. Um, and just being like, no, no, no. We're just, like, we're just gonna keep doing this. You know, like it's just one stroke at a time, like death by a thousand cuts. Like, like you knew, right? You knew everyone was gonna go out. Yeah. That's it's that's what they that's what people felt that they had to do in order to beat us. People thought that they had to go out out of the blocks as hot as possible, get as big of a lead as they possibly could and hope that we wouldn't pass them. And so you kind of prepare yourself for that. But at the same time, you have to have a level of calmness and intensity and focus and confidence in both yours and the eight other women in the boat with you that if you stick to your plan and do what you know how to do you will you will be successful and um it doesn't matter what happens in the first 250 or the first 500 it's like get into your race do your race stick to your plan don't react to what's happening yeah. around you do your plan and i think that's just what that's just what we did, you know, Caitlin did a great job of like, yep, this is where we are. This is what's happening. This is where we need to be, you know, and you just chip away. Yeah. And any, any memories of coming into the finish or. Yes, I do. I distinctly remember Caitlin celebrating and then telling us we had crossed the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> And I, it's funny, if you watch the video, you can see it happen. Like we're all still hauling on it and she's like dragging her hands in the water. And then you see a stop. And I remember thinking, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Why are we how, still going? Uh, how, how far did winning Olympic gold once or twice change your life? It didn't change my life. You know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still the same person. You know, I just have, I've, I've just done and accomplished this really cool sporting feat you know like i'm i i've evolved and developed and grown as a person because of all of these experiences but you know i i'm fundamentally still just me you know i have two olympic gold medals that's great that's really cool and it, it'll always be something that um i cherish for you know for a long time, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change my worth. It doesn't change, you know, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't change what people should think about me. Like mm. I'm just me, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I am grateful for the experiences and the opportunity to have them, to get them. There's two, two questions come in. Uh, another Brandon, this one, Brandon Tucker, um, about, <laughs> Tom Tahar's technical approach, uh, talking about the bigger swing, and yeah. then the Mo Roa. Hi there, both of you. Uh, the US Women's Eight always had a big swing layback. Was that coached, or did it come naturally from the crew? So, uh, a couple of couple of questions there. So let's see. Um, the bigger swing always seems to be a comment. I mean, let's be real, Martin. You don't always like the way the US Women row either. So. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's it's coached in in a sense. We don't spend all year our only technical focus thinking about sending it long. But yeah, it is it is one of um, I think de depending on the the athlete that you have in the boat, like the um, the size of the athlete and the power and um, kind of their ability to execute and. Uh, get something out of it. I think it can be really beneficial, but I think again, it's, it's a, it's a boat to boat thing. Like if you look at our boat from um, this year or excuse me, last year, whatever year you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or primary, I would say in general, the 2016 to 2020 quad in general, there wasn't as, there was not nearly as much 
of the back end uh, send, you know, and I, that's, in my opinion, a product of the personnel, right? Like you, you can't, you kind of have to alter and tinker what you do with what you're given. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in my first and second quads, um, yeah, it was, de- that was definitely one of the technical focuses when we came close to racing that he did focus on. Um, I know. I don't know if that answers the question. That yeah. Is, kind of. I think, what, what, uh, what about the front end of stroke? What was the technical focus there? Uh, I mean, you like, you got to get your blade in and you got to get on it. You know, like it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I don't, again, I don't think it, I don't think, and I could be wrong. I don't think that there is, um, magic or like some giant secret is to how you take a stroke that is going to make you win. I think the, 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 um, the concept of the stroke is the same for everyone in the sense that like you have to get your blade in, you have to suspend your weight and you have to move the boat past the blade. That's what you have to do. How you do it varies from person to person. Like, do you have extremely long femurs and a short torso? Do you have shorter, like really long quad or excuse me, really long calves? Like what is it, you know, structurally that's going to look different from person to person. Uh But the end goal is the same. Put your blade in before you put weight on the foot stretcher. Get your weight up quickly. Hold on to it long. Let it go cleanly. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's it's not. Um, it's not like voodoo science here. It's just you, how you teach that and how that happens with each individual person is kind of the nuances of coaching, right? Like for a coach to be, and I can't do it. Like I can't look at an athlete and be like, oh, this person would benefit more from you know, if they didn't lay back as much or if they laid back yeah. way more, or, you know, if they dropped the, their shoulders slightly or bent their arm a little bit here, like, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, why did you decide to take a break from rowing or not row after the Rio Olympics? And I'm interested, you know, particularly bearing in mind how resilient that you, you obviously had been or you obviously are. Um, why that came into your thinking? Sure. Um, so I took a break because I kind of needed to, from uh, a mental perspective, I had been doing it since for two full four year cycles. Um, and I wanted to take a break from it to kind of remove myself from it a little bit and see where my interest still was where my drive still was like, did who I did, I want to continue to do this because I actually wanted to continue to do it or did I want to continue to do it because I knew nothing else. Uh And for me, it was because I wanted to continue to do it. Yeah. You know, like I loved it. I loved racing. I loved training. I loved competing. I loved being part of a team. Um, And so it, it, but it was important for me to step away from it a little bit. And it's, it's hard. Like for me, you know, and again, I can only speak for myself for me. um, uh, It, it's hard uh, mentally on your, uh, and I'm hard on myself. And so like that can wear on you, you know, it it adds up um, on your, on a day-to-day basis, just kind of the, the, the line that you tow um, and uh, the, the level of what you demand from yourself on a day-to-day basis for me can start. It's, it's one could argue that it's probably not incredibly healthy, yeah, but it is what I credit to part of my success to, you know, is, is the ability to kind of hold myself to a standard that is pretty hard. So when you came out of, right, I mean, how much did you, were you training during that, right? What did you do during that time? Uh, I didn't do any rowing or erging at all. I moved to San, I actually moved out here to San Francisco yeah. um, with, do you remember Kate Burko? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Kate. So I lived with Kate Burko. Um, she's like, Hey, come out. She lived out here. She was coaching at uh, Stanford lightweight women. And she was like, come out here, live with me uh, and see if you like it. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's do it. And so I moved, packed up and moved and uh, started working at um, a, a gym, a local gym, a CrossFit gym and did a lot of personal training. Um, and then I went down, 
when did I go down? I went down to Chula in 2018. So a year after, no, 2018, winter of 2018, I went down to Chula and rode around in the launch with Laurel and just watched the, the women that were out there training. Yeah. And uh, just talked to her. And I remember just looking at Laurel and being like, Laurel, I really miss this. She's like, yeah. She's like, it's, it's, and I was like, it's hard. She's like, yep. And I was like, you know, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if, if, if I want to come back, like, is this what I, is this what I want to do? Like, I think it might be what I want to do, but I don't know. And, you know, she gave me some really great advice as Laurel often does. And, uh, was like, well, why don't you just, you know, I'll send you a training program or first she said, why don't you just start getting back on the erg, get on the erg and, you know, see if after a month of erging every day, you still have that same feeling. And I was like, all right, fair enough. And she's like, and if you still have that same feeling, you know, reach out, you know, let me know how it goes, reach out to me, tell me. And, you know, then we can send you a training plan and you can, I was like, cause I was like, I can't, I don't want to go back to Princeton right now. I can't go back yeah. to Princeton right now. I just, I don't. And she's like, that's fine. And she's like, we'll send you a training plan. And then you can, you know, and so that's, that's kind of how it happened. It was this slow progression. I never felt any, um, pressure from anyone other than my myself to want to to do it and so I would work at this it's actually kind of funny I worked at this gym and I would coach classes and I had personal training clients and I would spend uh I had a class that I coached from 6 to 7 a.m and then I would work out from like 7 15 to 9 15 at the gym early yeah. doing whatever amount of erg volume I had to do that morning and of course these are CrossFit athletes who do no more than like 500 yeah, yeah. On the earth. and they would always laugh and they got so used to me doing it. Cause I was doing it at this, I did it for months at this point and they'd be like, Oh, there's Megan. How long are you on there? I'm like, Oh, you know, just like 90 minutes today. Not bad. And they're like 90 minutes. They're like in a row. How do you hold the same uh, number? <laughs> and, uh, and then I would go and, um, you know, train some clients and then I would go to another class that I had to coach and, and then I would immediately erg again. So I didn't row. I just started erging and I worked with, um, a man out here, who uh, is really great in the strength and conditioning world. And he helped, I wanted to work on my leg strength because uh, yeah. my leg strength has never been incredible and it's not bad, but yeah, yeah. never. And so I was like, okay. Um, I, he worked with me and wrote a strength program that was strictly leg based. And I did it, you know, I did a, I think it was a four or six week cycle of that. And it, it was pretty cool to watch it, to see it pay off in terms of like the amount of weight that I was able to move and like the strength that I gained um, so, you know, like I, I never got away from working out and from being fit. Um, yeah. and then let's see, it was around November of 2018. Yeah. It must've been November of 2018 when Tom was like, okay, we're six K testing and uh, on this date in November, uh, come back, pull a six K with the team. I was like, all right. And so this was kind of the, this was going to be the one where I was like, all right, this, where am I at in comparison to what's going yeah. on? You know, cause I didn't, I didn't really know what was happening with the other women, obviously. Um, and so I went, I flew across the country and, you know, did my 6k test and, um, did fine. And that was kind of when I made the decision, I was like, all right, I'm going to rejoin the team when they go to Chula Vista in January. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I did. That, um, quadrennial for the U S team, it, it, it was very different to, the ones before in, in, you know, the result in the 2017 worlds was, was kind of, I guess, unexpected for mm -hmm. people that had seen the U S win everything. And then 2018, I think the U S eight women won mm -hmm. the, the world title. Um, and then you were in that 2019, eight that got Third. a bronze medal yep. behind Australia and Canada, yep. uh, behind New Austra uh, Australia, New Zealand. Sorry. Yep. Um, what was going on? Do you think? How do you? I think it's just again, it's just a different group of a different group of women. You know, like I, um, you can't win all the time. No, no one wins all of the time. Every single time, we won for a very long period of time, but I mean that ends at some point. It ends, and you know, like other teams, like it's not like other teams stop improving, you know, like t it's a, a natural cycle of, of the sport, you know, like look, look at the, the natural cycle of any great team. They always have, you know, 
periods of yeah. up and down. Like how, how long you're up is, you know, varies, but eventually you lose or you don't win. And it's, it's, I don't think it's any one thing. You know, I think it's a very, very young group, uh, was a very, very young group of the women that were in, um, you know, the, the Rio boat that came back. There was one, two, if you count Caitlin, mm. you know, one of, one of eight or two of nine, that's a small amount. And then you have yeah. these athletes are, you know, fresh out of college or have, zero international racing experience they're starting their careers and i don't think it it um it does them a disservice to be like well you you failed because you didn't win well no that's 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 not true you know they are starting their journey in the sport this is where they're starting you know and I, it it was different right like you know it's it's a it teaches you to redefine what success means uh, yeah. as, as, for me as an athlete that came from um, that I was lucky enough to be in the last seven years of the 11. Right. And so, but it, but you have to, you have to adjust, you have to adapt. It's the nature of the sport. It's the nature so of I the guess, sport. I guess success in 2019 was qualifying for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and, and well, coming away with a medal. Uh, yeah. despite despite the fact you were behind that battle out in front between Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. You know, and that's they Australia and New Zealand are great teams. Credit to them. They were better. Like that that I think it's it, I think it would be unfair to be like, "Oh, we had a bad race. That's the only reason we lost." No. They're better. They were mm. good. They deserved to win on that day. And, th and that's okay. Mm. Right. Like that's just the nature of it. Like sometimes you're, sometimes you're going to come up against another crew that is just a little bit better. And that's, that's sport, <laughs> you know, on that day. Yeah. That Olympic regatta, the Tokyo Olympic regatta must have felt quite strange, you know, particularly bearing in mind, you had a great start to the regatta beating, Romania and Australia in your first heat to go direct through to the final, which must have felt great. Yeah. And then, was, yeah, go on. It was, it was in a, it was a great race. Our first race was, I was very, very pleased and satisfied with how it went. You know, I thought we executed it the, to the best of our ability. I thought we really showed our, showed our ability and our, um, you know, strength as a boat, like we came together as a, as, a, as a boat and showed up. And that was that, that win in the heat was the end result of that. Um, and then we didn't race in the rep. I really wish we had, you know, I think with a, with a crew that young, I think you need, I don't, I, look, we're all fit enough to race three times in five days or whatever it is, right. Six days. Yeah. Um, I, and I think especially given the lockdown and the quarantine that all different crews went through um, the, and how it like, took away opportunities to race and for the experience and to kind of like not only experience racing, but experience the, the emotions, the feelings, the anxieties, the, <clears throat> the expectations that you put on yourself, the pressure, whatever it is that you do for a race, being able to experience that one more time would have been hugely beneficial. Yeah. Um, I, I think that can be said for any of the crews. Um, and then we had our final and, um, it, it was not a great race. I don't, I don't feel it was a great race. Again, I do feel that, you know, the crews that beat us were better than us on that day. They deserve mm. to win. You know, like it's all about what you do in that moment on that day. Like, it doesn't matter if our time was. 10 seconds slower or 10 seconds faster than the boat that came away with an Olympic gold medal on the final day. It matters what you do on that day in that race. And mm -hmm. we didn't have, we didn't have a good race and that's, that's what happens. And yes, it was really hard. You know, it, it was, um, it's challenging. Um, 
to feel like, and again, pressure that I put on myself, right? Mm. Uh, it's challenging to not come away from that and me, myself, who I am as a person, be like, am I a joke? Does everyone think that I'm a joke now? And like, that's a ridiculous statement. I'm a three-time Olympian. I was part of an incredible program. I got to row with, you know, 15 years worth of amazing women, both at the training center that made the team and the ones that didn't make the team. And yet when I cross the finish line, one of the thoughts I have is I'm not good enough. Wow. You know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's not right for any athlete to have. And yet I know a lot of athletes that feel that way. Mm. And it's not talked about a lot because it's, it's not glamorous and it's not like, oh yeah, you'll get them next time. Well, for some of those athletes, there is no next time. That was their time. Yeah. And it's so, it can be soul crushing. Yeah. But I'm proud of all of the women that I raced with 100%. Like I, I, it was, it was great. It was an amazing experience. And I'm so glad that I was able to, to race down the track with them, but it, coming away in fourth place. Yeah. Not the dream end to my career, not my yeah. hand ending. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. 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 And you had, you were out of there. That's the reality. Like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah. You were out of there quite quickly. You must've been back in the States. Just yeah. A couple of days later. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had to leave, we had to leave, uh, I think within two days or something, we had to get out of there. Yeah. Uh, and so we were back and then, um, I got, um, my wedding was like a month and a half after that. So, yeah, but yeah, you know, it's, 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 um, sport at the elite level is hard. Winning is hard. Losing is hard. It's all hard, Mm. but for me, it's all worth it. Would I go back and do it again? Yeah. Mm. The experiences I have were amazing. Does that, you know, does that mean that it was all, you know, glittery and gold and awesome all the time absolutely not but that's what made the times that were awesome that much better yeah i want to talk a bit about tom tahar in terms of coaching because the, the, there were some some issues um i gather around the way that tom coached or related to his athletes and i just want to get your views on that. I mean, clearly you're a massive supporter of Tom and his achievements and and everything he's done. Um, Do you think the athletes coming into the team are changing now and have different requirements of their coach, different expectations? What's your sense of that? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, I don't, again, I don't, um, I don't think that that's any fault of their own. Um, I think that it's just the, the nature of the way athletes are nowadays. And I know that makes me sound old and it is what it is, but yeah, I think it's a different type of athlete. Um, having said that, I don't think it's right or wrong. I just think it's different. And I think um, having to adapt and adjust to that takes time. And um, you have to be willing to give someone time to do that uh, in order, in order for it to happen. And I think both Tom and Laurel, uh, tried very hard to, um, adapt and adjust and Mm -hmm. learn new things and take different, um, take a different approach, um, that would work best with a different, with a different group of athletes. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think it is, I do think it is a different type of athlete, but again, I don't think that it's, it's better or worse. I just think that it's different. Yeah. So there are big changes in a lot of programs and the USA is, is clearly one of those programs where there have been uh, massive changes. Um, what do those changes mean for the women from, from your perspective? Uh, well, from my perspective, it, <laughs> again, as you know, I'm obviously a, a huge supporter of Tom and Laurel. Um, those changes mean that they lost you know, one of the greatest coaches, rowing coaches. Um, and they still have Laurel, which is great. Um, yeah. They still have uh, the Princeton Princeton Training Center location, which I think is great for um, development. 
I think it's going to, I think there's going to be some growing pains and some learning curve, uh, some steep learning curves, um, both from um, the coach's perspective, but also from the athletes um, that are used to a particular system. Cause Tom, you know, Tom's been, it's been Tom's system for since what, 2006, 2005. I should know that, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's been, it's, it's been one way or sim a similar way for so long. And so yeah. now it's like, okay, well, this is, this is happening. And I don't, I don't think change is bad at all. You know, I, I think certain, I think in order for things to evolve, things need to change. Um, what specifically we might differ on. Um, I might have different opinions than someone else on, but I don't, I don't think change is necessarily bad. Um, I think the women, their job doesn't change, right? Like as an athlete, your job never, your job doesn't change. You still need to show up to train and to try and do the best that you can do to put yourself in the best position, right? Like control what you can do. What I talk, I talk to the women that are on the team still, um, I'm, in, I'm in contact with a variety yeah. of them and throughout this process, which is hard, right? Like they lost their head coach and it's like, control. I used to tell them, control what you, you can control and you have to let the rest go because it's wasted energy. It's really, really hard to do, but you mm. really have to focus on what you can control. And that's your effort every day, like your day-to-day -day effort and what you mm. put in. Um, and I think that's really important to remember through, you know, in general is a life lesson, right? Like, you know, I, I can't, I can't yeah. worry about what this person's doing or what this person's saying, or if this might happen three months from now, or this could potentially happen a year from now, like, what am I doing today? How am I doing, setting myself up to be, to show up tomorrow? You know, like what, what can I control? Yeah. As, as Jose Vidong shot, the, uh, the Dutch women's coach, has, has he, been over to the US already? Is is he been doing anything so far? Yeah, he's uh, he's been very active. So they, um, I haven't spoken to him obviously because I'm quote unquote retired. So it's not like he needs to, to uh, talk to me. But he's been in touch with the women. He's very involved. Uh, he's talked to the men. He, I believe, um, he, I believe he's in the states currently, or he will be soon. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what he does. You know, uh, it's a, it's a fresh face. It's a fresh, uh, uh, fresh ideas. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's exciting. I think it's an exciting time. Yeah. And I guess U S women have got so many great female oars women to, to choose from the pool is, is so big. Oh uh, yeah. Because of the collegiate system, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a large pool of athletes. That's correct. You have to manage the pool to get the talent out of it, right? Like just because they're there doesn't mean you know mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna get them out of it. Um, but I think, yeah, that you know from a developmental perspective, I think uh, there are some incredible collegiate coaches that are developing the 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 upcoming women in it in a great way. Yeah. Do you see the U.S. women back on the medals podium this year at the World Championships? Oh, I don't know. I don't know enough about. Uh, I can't make that prediction. I don't. I don't know enough about uh, what they're doing, how they're performing, and I know absolutely nothing about what any other country is doing. So yeah. I can, you know, like for all I know, some random country that's never rode before and not in in their life is going to show up and win in a medal because of what they're doing. Right. Like I can't, I can't make that prediction. I don't know. Mm. You know, I think, I think I know whoever it is, whoever is going to end up on the podium is going to be a, a quick, a quick crew. Yeah. Because I think the, the level of uh, women's rowing uh, in the world has, has been elevating every single year. And it's really incredible to watch. Mm -hmm. How strange did it feel to be, you know, part of all that process of that soul searching that us rowing seemed to be going through post tokyo uh yeah it was it was strange it was different it was hard um because i was you know not rowing anymore but still a part of what was what was going on and you know fighting for um the athletes voices to be heard 
Uh, and, um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of what I, what's important to me is like us rowing is saying that everything, uh, they want it to be more athlete centric and be all about the athlete. And like, you know, well, you know, that's great and really nice to say, um, I, I really want to see it happen versus like, just talk about having it happen. Mm. You know, like if it is all about your athletes, then what are you, what are you going to do to kind of drive that point home? Yeah. And I don't, it doesn't have to be big things. It can be little things, you know, like, I mean, it, it was interesting. I was talking to um, my husband the other day when Hamish retired and like, it's all over uh, rowing New Zealand's Instagram and everything. Cause he's one of the greatest Kiwi rowers of all time that retired. And I think to myself, like when Caroline retired or L. Logan retired or Karen yeah. retired, you know, I'm only thinking of women. I could name men, obviously, and nothing was said. And it's like, well, what about your athletes that just gave you so much of their time, so much of their life mm. at their own choice? Right. Obviously. But like incredible careers, women that, you know, defined, helped define my rowing career. Mm. You know, like if it's about the athletes, make it about the athletes. Yeah. You, you were named U.S. Rower of the Year, were you, when you came back from Tokyo Olympics? Yeah. I saw, was that the first time that you'd received that honour? Yeah, it was. That... It was the first time, which was, uh, it's an incredible honour because it's voted on, you know, by, by my teammates, which is. Is it? Yeah. And the teammates and my coaches vote on it. And so it's, um, uh, it meant a lot to me. It was really humbling and uh, quite an honour because I, again, I respect the women that I train with so much. and. Uh, I would not be the athlete I am today without, without them. And I know it sounds yeah. cliche, but it's, it's so true. Yeah, it really is. They made, they made me a better rower. Mm. Probably made me a better um, person too. Yeah. I kind of, uh, I know from listening to a few things about you, um, it probably uh, wouldn't be right if we, if you didn't mention something about your mom and your dad. I know your dad passed when you're in college. Um, but I know how pivotal your parents have been to your career. Yeah. You know, my, so my dad, it's actually interesting. I think about it. Um, my dad only saw me row once and it was my freshman year, uh, of college and I was a starboard then. Huh. Uh, <laughs> thank God I switched to the, the right side, if you will. Um, and, uh, it's funny uh, and sad a little to think, what I've done with something that he has never, he has not seen, you know, my dad was one of my biggest fans, right? He always came to all my basketball, my sister and my basketball games, soccer games, you name it, both him and my parents were there, you know, kind of supporting me. And uh, so I know that he, he would be super proud, but it's just funny to think of all that I've done in this sport and he hasn't seen any of it or like he hasn't been here for any of it. Um, but then there's my mom who uh, I'm obviously, it's my mom, my sister and myself. And uh, it's been, I mean, gosh, it's almost been 20 years since my dad's been, since my dad's passed, but, uh, you know, unwavering support from, from my mom, uh, you know, and it, anybody who is the, uh, parent of a rower, or I would imagine many other athletes knows that, uh, it's not, I'm not always calling, smiling and laughing. That's for sure. Yeah. Long suffering parent. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, after, after London, I think she was, uh, I wouldn't, she probably was not surprised at all that I was like, yeah, I'm going back. Uh, after Rio, I think she was maybe hoping that I'd be like, okay, that's good enough, but no, no. Uh, and so now, uh, it's, it's definitely, but it, to her credit, she has always been 110% supportive. I like, guess yeah. this is what you want to do. Yes, mom, this is what I want to do. Okay. You know, and, it, wow. and you know, I get, she's, very athletic and active as well. So I have to thank her because that's the hearty stock that I come from. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your hopes for the future now, Megan? Um, well, a big sigh. <laughs> I don't, I don't have such a huge question. <laughs> what does the future hold? I don't know. You know, I imagine it, it, it's going to be more of good times and bad times and lots of lessons and, kind of experiencing life outside of rowing, you know, and it's, uh, I'm excited. It's, it's a 
whole new journey and a whole new set of opportunities that I get to kind of embark on now. And um, I'm looking forward to it. You know, and there are times where it's like, oh, God, what am I doing? Like, well, I don't know how to do anything but row. Maybe I should go get back in a boat or something. Uh, and then there are times where it's like, no, this is awesome. Like, I can go out on a Friday night if I want and stay out past 9 p.m. and not feel like <laughs> I'm going to die the next morning when I wake up or something. And it's 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 fun and exciting and scary and uh, a lot all rolled into one. Wow. So, Megan, I have to say a massive thank you for, you know, spending the last hour and a quarter on Cross's Corner. It's been an absolute privilege to listen yeah. to you and talk so animatedly about <laughs> your career and, uh, and, and all those experiences. There's probably a lot that we haven't covered. It was wonderful to talk with you. And thanks for taking the time, you know, and hearing my story. It's, you know, it, I, again, I can't say enough. I'm, I'm super grateful for everything that this sport has given me. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's been a wild ride and I'm excited for what's next. And I will never forget when you said in uh, Lake Agbalet, when we were losing at the World Cup and you were like, I don't think the U.S. women are going to do it. And I remember watching it back and uh, like, oh, we're going to do it, Martin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I was going to ask you about that race, that 2014 eights race, because you've all been in the pairs, hadn't you? Oh, yeah. That was probably, and people are always asking, oh, what's your favorite race? That's definitely, that one ranks right up at the top. It's, uh, that was, that was something else. Yeah. It was an amazing race to commentate on as well. Couldn't <laughs> believe it. Yeah. So, but I mean, thank you for everything that you do, you know, and, putting our sport out there and, you know, just talking to us. It's, it's, wow. it's great and we appreciate it. Thank you, Megan. We'll end the live part of this interview now. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Musnicki.